Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today I am joined by Mark Livesey from Treeline Academy, and we're going to talk a little bit more about e-scouting for elk. And today, if you haven't if you haven't listened to the previous ones, we've done a series of these. There's a playlist on my YouTube of all of those. You can go to Mark's Treeline Academy website, and there's going to be a list of all the podcasts he's done with me, along with everyone else you've done. He's a podcast. I don't want to use the word. You know that just uh, he's uh, <laughs> he's not loyal to just I, one I, podcast. I always say, you know, I've got a face for radio, right? <laughs> you know, you're one of the few podcasts that that go on YouTube, so um, people are going to see me with my glasses and my, you know. But I, I've got a I've yeah. got a voice. I've got a face for radio is what I always say. Yeah, well, I don't agree. Like you're an ex Iron Man athlete. Uh, there, there's there's a little manliness there uh, that comes with that. But we, okay. we've, we've covered this a couple of times. If you haven't listened to those other ones, you might want to go back. We're going to skip ahead straight to this module, this topic we're covering today. And uh, it's, it's about what, fires and – Fires care- and logging areas. We're going to, um, so we're trying to do this, this series mm-hmm. on the different modules of the course. So we can you – know, we, we kind of get off track a little. But the, the focus of each one of these modules is to kind of introduce you to some of the concepts – that are in each one of these modules and hopefully, you know, not only introduce you what's in the course, but give you a few tips that you can apply to your um, elk hunting strategy or your hunt planning or however the way you do it. You know, my way isn't the only way. It's just a way. And um, so, you know, we talked about this in lag podcast. I think hunters, if you want to become a next level hunter, Mm -hmm. You have to focus on your gear and your fitness, of course. But I think that we get too focused on that sometimes. I know I do. I get obsessed with what gear I'm running, you know, how fit I am, how, what can I, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? Especially as I get older, it's becoming more of an issue. But at the same time, you know, not neglecting our knowledge. I mean, it's really important that we look for ways. That's why you're listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, some of it's entertainment, but Every time you listen to a podcast, you're not only listening to it to be entertained. Hopefully, you're going to walk away with some life improvement nuggets, some hunting. You know, depends on what type of podcast you're listening to, business improvement. Yeah. And um, and that's really what this series is about is, you know, having some fun with it, <laughs> um, which we always do. But also really giving you some very specifics um, on maybe a new way to look at things or yeah. how to break it down. So, anyway. Um, maybe that's a good enough introduction, but yeah, so I think, um, I think that, you know, for those that don't know, Mark has this course, it's been up for a couple of years now. I'm about a year and a half now, year and a half now. It's pretty new. Everyone who has purchased it, the word has been, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it, it's got, uh, it to me, um, it's really proven, but for those who aren't ready to pull the trigger on that, aren't sure if they want to you're going to get a lot out of just listening to the podcast and we're hoping to bring value there too, but also it might boost your confidence in investing in the class. Sure. And, um, you know, again, I'm not here to necessarily sell you on the course. I just want to present it to you and you make your own judgment. Yep. Um, there's a lot of information at treelightacademy.net just about the course. There's an intro video. There's the list of all the modules, the agenda. And like I said, there's a, <laughs> plethora of podcasts yeah. <laughs> that you get listen to. Yeah. Um, pretty much a whole year's worth. Of There's so much really. good information in there. So the last one that we did was drainages, canyons, canyons creeks, and, dra- and drainages. Yeah. Uh, so right. we kind of covered, touch on that just a, a little bit. And, uh, that was the previous one we did. And now we're getting into to this one. And then there's a whole, I think, six other ones from before, five or six other yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. So. so this one's about the middle of the elk finding features. So this is like about number five, I think, of the of the 10 elk finding features. But this one's fires and logging areas. Okay, tell me about this because this is something I get questions about all the this time. This is probably the most – this is the module I get the most questions on. And this is probably where people think that fires are magical. You know, they're magical <laughs> when it comes to elk and it's the end all. And there's no doubt, guys, fires are, are freaking good for elk. Now, you know, I talk about when I first get in the court, I talk about, you know, it's, if you live in the West for any length of time, fires, it, it's a love hate relationship. Like right now, we are smoked in out here in the West. Mm-hmm. Missoula is terrible. You can't see, you can't breathe. 
Um, there's fires everywhere. It's super dry and it's stressful. I mean, praise the, the firefighters and the people that are out there. I mean, guys, this stuff is, it's devastating. It's, it's just, it's brutal for un- unlocked. So, you know, I don't want to celebrate. It doesn't help. That's right. That, I'm not here to celebrate wildfires, but what I am here to do is when it comes to elk hunting is show you that there is at least a silver lining to these things. And, um, hopefully as a, as a community, we will start to educate ourselves on proper logging and thinning and, and yeah. taking the right steps to manage this incredible resource we have, which maybe we have not done such a good, um, you know, and I'm not here to debate that either. What we're here to talk about is fires and how they relate to elk hunting, not to debate whether it's a positive or a negative. Yep. But I read a report. I was going to start off with this, that there's several studies that I've read for fires. There's a lot of information about fires and animal and wildlife and even elk use of fires. So I spent a lot of time when I developed this course researching because I've always found a lot of elk in and around fire areas. And I want to know why. I'm one of those guys that it's one thing to know that they're attracted to them. What I want to know is why are they attracted to them? What brings them to it? What keeps them there? What is their driving force? And, um, and you know, just all the details around it. So in this module, there's a lot of reference to research, a lot of numbers, a lot of things to kind of get you started before we start getting into breaking them down. So I want to just throw out a couple of things is one, you know, there's been several cases where elk populations have increased by more than 70% in areas that have had fires. That's an incredible number. That's yeah, huge. A 70% increase in elk numbers. Wow. And it's just related to the tremendous growth and mm-hmm. regrowth. Um, you know, and just the, the, the. It's not all that surprising though. No, when, not really. When, when, when you, you look at it. a super timbered area. Right. Now, when I say that, I mean that in densely timbered areas. Yeah. You, when you look at stuff like that and then all of a sudden it's just gone and it's grass as far as you can see, you know, as it comes back, if it's the right kind of burn and everything and it bounces in. You could just see how animals that were normally didn't have the feed and, and all the growth opportunity, all of a sudden they do. And their options for avoiding predators dramatically increase because their food sources are more broad and dispersed. And yeah, I could see it. So now remember when I say 70% increase, that doesn't mean it increased the population of elk by 70%. I may have misspoke. It increases it in that area. So that may mean that elk are moving to that area because it's a more desired location. Yep, absolutely. But it also means it can support more. Either elk. way, as a hunter, I don't care. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so we're not I just here. know the burn's magic. So, you know, what most people don't understand about fires is that they think about the grass that grows up in the fires. But when I started researching it, that's not what the elk are after in hmm. those fires. Elk, most people think of elk as grazers, which I did too. Aren't they though, like compared to a deer, they're much more yes, of a grazers. Abso- than absolutely. A but elk are very, um, I don't want to say one dimensional cause that's not, but they, their stomachs are, when I did the research on the basic needs of elk, which is another module in the course, it was surprising to me how elk will switch food sources. Like they, they're not real good. Like deer or browsers, they can eat a variety of food sources at the same time. Elk don't tend to do that as much. They tend to focus on one type, then the next type, then the next type, and their digestive system adjusts to do it. So what happens with these fire areas is that it presents this opportunity for regrowth of grasses, but more importantly, the woody plants and the shrubs and the flowering, the forbs, you know, the increase in the flowering plants or the forbs or the bigger leaf plants, Hmm. those are what... I believe are the elk are targeting as much or more than the quote grasses that are growing up. Mm -hmm. So, and that goes along with some of the research as well. So what it creates is guys is elk, that variety of vegetation. Remember what I said, how elk don't tend to eat a lot of variety at the same time, Yeah, but they eat a lot of variety over the course of a year. Uh Uh-huh. So what I'm saying is these fire areas can support the elk during the times that they're more dependent and more focused on grass, Mm -hmm. like in May, June. Yep. Then as they start switch to more, uh, or forbs in the early season, to grasses mid season, to woody plants and brush in winter and late season. So it has it all is what I'm saying Mm -hmm. is that these fires generate this plethora or this variety, especially on the edges. We're going to talk about that. 
but the edges of these fires are the key focal areas um, for for the vegetation group. Fifty percent of the vegetation variety in a burn happens within fifty feet of the edge. It's crazy um, that how much variety of vegetation is available just a little out into the open, just a little into the timber, both sides. Really? Both sides, because certain forbs require a certain amount of shade. They yeah. can't grow in direct sunlight. Certain um, brushy plants or woody plants, same thing. They thrive with the right amounts of sunlight versus not direct sunlight. So these edge habitats are really vital when it comes to val- evaluating fires. Um, so, you know, one of the other things um, that I found, most people think of burns of being a two to three year old burn is prime, prime time for elk. And I'm not saying it's not, but most of the studies that I've read indicate that elk really key in on burns from 10 to 12 years. Now, as he gets closer to that 12, the attraction is waning. Okay. That doesn't mean that it's not there. It obviously is at its peak in that two to three, but don't discount a fire completely mm-hmm. because it's in the five to seven again it depends on the fire depends on the regrowth depends on how much shade it's getting how much how devastating was the fire what time of year the fire started um all these things can contribute to quote the life expectancy of a fire as it relates to the attractiveness um to this elk one of the fires that i really like to hunt this one area. So you guys, if you've listened to much of my stuff, you guys know that I'm kind of a new area guy, meaning I do not go back to the same places very often. I, <laughs> I And I know that that does not help my success. I know. I understand. But I'm an adventurer. I yeah. love new places. And I love developing new places. And so maybe if I have any skill at East County, maybe that's one of the reasons why is because I'm always developing new spots. Um, like on my, on my elk planting right now, I'm, I've gone so overboard this year. I've only got one or two elk tags this year. So I'm just wearing it out in Montana and I've got like 12 places I'm looking at right now, 12 different locations. And I'm, I'm just struggling like, okay, which one, which one? And so I just haven't figured it out yet. I keep working on all of them and one of them is going to rise to the top and I'm going to make a pick or make my choice at some point. But there's this one area that I do, I have been back to three times and I have sent several of my friends in there. Every single one of my friends have gone in there and have killed elk and it's a burn and it's a six, seven year old burn, mm-hmm. but it's got the right mix. And one of the things that everybody's going to ask is what is that mix? Well, this particular burn burnt very strangely. It jumped it would burn a pocket and somehow it would jump like it got in the crown and it went over to, I, you know, I don't know the fire terminology, but I'm just telling you what this cr- created was a mosaic. I call it a mosaic pattern where the edge is like the, it just, it's just squiggly. Mm. It's not a square burn. You know, a lot of fires will burn to an edge and yeah. it'll be a straight yeah. line. This one did not. This one burnt down into ditches and left the entire ditch alone. It burnt up on the ridge and left half the ridge not burned. And then it burnt over the ridge. It burnt a whole big basin. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I think that randomness of the burn created such a diverse amount of vegetation. Mm -hmm. And it has some low-lying areas that were holding moisture. And those areas that were holding moisture, the weight, the grass in there was chest, neck deep. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. And it's still like that six, seven years later. So I think that that particular burn, because of the way it burnt, the mosaic pattern it left, and the sheer amount of edge habitat that it left, and the low-lying uh, moisture-holding areas, and it was not a steep area. Mm-hmm. It was moderately steep. We talked about that in the last podcast real quickly. But, guys, burns that happen on super steep slopes tend to take longer to regrow because of the moisture content. Right. So when you're evaluating and you're looking at terrain and you see 30 degree slopes and it's a burn, you're like, maybe I'm going to give that one three to four years to be prime. Mm. It may not be as good year one or two guys are always telling me like, well out, for example, in Missouri river, you know, the Missouri river um, breaks area of Montana. We've had some of the biggest fires in Montana have been out there in the last few years and the deer, mainly deer and elk, are moving into these fires 
year one. Like they burn one year, and the next year there's animals in those burns. Really? And everybody's like, why? And I'm like, well, the main reason is because they're at a gentle slope. Mm-hmm. They're holding moisture. They're growing back quicker than um, – than some of these steeper burns. So it's just one thing to keep in mind. And we cover a lot of that in the course, but um, mm. pay attention to the boundaries. The more jagged the edge, the more I tend to like it. The more entrant and extra ex- entrance and exit points to the burn um, I like. And what I mean by that is drainages that run into the burns, guys. When you look at these in Google Earth and you're zooming in and you see a drainage that runs out into a burn, and the burn is gray. It looks gray on Google Earth. And you're looking at it in August. You're looking at it in July. If you could find that historical imagery, that's one of the reasons I like Google Earth. Because I can look at the dates of the imagery. It's really important fires. Again, uh, again, using the right tool for the job. If you're using only Onyx, if you're using only Gaia or Go on or, or whatever you're using, this is not available because you can't look at the dates. You have no idea what you're looking at. So if I'm looking at an August picture and I see this burn and it's all gray and I see this green ribbon running out of the timber, out into the burn, I'm like, that's got my attention. That ribbon runs into the timber. What that's telling me, and then I'll switch over to the topographic map and I see, sure enough, it's a small drainage that's reaching out in that burn. I can almost guarantee you that the elk are coming and going from that burn in that spot. Mm. You know, they're not going to walk out in a burn and cross the entire burn to get to that drainage. Now, mm-hmm. no, I shouldn't say they won't. Again, it's an odds thing. Yeah. The odds are if there's these drainages, a few of these drainages around this burn, guys, it's the first place to check. That's the entrances and exits. Even look for burns. And when you're looking at a burn too, look for burns that have these island timber patches. So what happens in a burn sometimes is there'll be a high moisture content area and it will burn. Like, for example, where an aspen patch is. A lot of times when there's mixed environments, meaning conifers and aspens, and there's a burn, a lot of times the aspens will survive because they're in the higher moisture content areas. The grass is greener, less likely to burn. And so you'll see these island timber patches. Some of the best elk hunting I've ever had has been in these you know, 40, 50, 100 acre timber patches in the middle or out on the, off the edges of these burns. They're like, they're like security islands for these elk. They can get in those islands and they can bed in there. They've got thermal protection from the sun. They can go out into the fire, into the fire and feed at night and in the mornings, but then regress right back into these islands and they can see 360. So they just feel so secure in these little island patches. So don't overlook those. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, again, and the more edge environment, the better. So when it comes to fires, you're looking at the age of the fire, but you're also looking at the design or the makeup of the fire. May, pay close attention. Zoom out. Study the fire. Also study where the people, where are people, because guys, fires are elk magnets. I mean, fires are hunter magnets as much as they are elk magnets. Let's just mm-hmm. be honest. And now with all the technology, being able to look at fires and see them and all the hunt platforms and everything, um, you know, everybody sees them. So let's just be honest about that. Where is the pressure coming from? We've talked about zones of pressure a million times, but where does the pressure come into these fires? You know, look where the roads are. Look for the trailheads. Are they on this? If the trailhead is over here on the north side of this burn, well, that north edge of that burn, if I'm talking a huge burn, let's say it's a 20,000 acre burn and there's a trailhead on the north side. Well, that north edge of that burn is probably going to get hit more than the south edge of that burn. I mean, I know that's common sense, guys, but sometimes guys do not zoom out enough and take the look at the big picture. If they built roads in, a lot of these burns get logged after the fact, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So they put roads in. Those roads are not on topo- topography maps a lot of times. Study them. Zoom in on Google Earth. Look for those roads. Look at how people are going to move around those burns. Look for those regresses. Look for those drainages. Any drainage that enters a burn, I am interested in. I'm super interested in it. One, because I know there's higher moisture content there. Two, I know that's going to grow back quicker than other places and three it's a it's a location that's got the most variety of vegetation because of those three things so 
Sometimes it can be daunting to look at a big, giant 30,000-acre burn and where am I going to start? Because, guys, sometimes hiking across a burn is not very fun, especially if it's an older burn Mm -hmm. and the timber starts to come down or you get a storm, stuff starts hitting the ground. That's what I was going to say is how, like, sometimes the burns are just, they seem unhuntable because they're just a a bunch of tinker toy logs, just, you know, matchstick box got just dumped. Guys, study the years, okay? And, you know, I I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but use the right tool for the job. Guys, the only way to look at fires on a high level is on Google Earth Pro. It's the only way. Because what you need to do is you need to be able to scroll back through the years. You can obviously see when the fire started, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you can go back and Google Earth. If Let's say it's a five-year-old fire, and there are images in the five-year. Guys, you can zoom in and see if the timber's on the ground. You can see it. So how you tell, sometimes they're like, well, I can't really tell if the timber's on the ground. I'm going to tell you a quick way to look at it. Look for the shadows, okay? When the timber is standing, when you look at it in Google Earth, Mm -hmm. you can see the dark shadow on the ground. It's subtle, but look for the shadows of the standing timber. If you can't see very many shadows, then the timber's on the ground. Um, are a lot of timbers on the ground. So look for the numbers of shadows that you can see. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, and, and I know that sounds obvious, but I don't know a lot of guys that do that. So when you're looking at Google Earth and you're zoomed in, you're looking at the shadow of, if you can see the shadows, you're like, okay, there's a lot of timber still standing. standing. Timber. Mm-hmm. And you can start to make some judgment calls on how much is on the ground and how much is still standing. You know, and so now that doesn't mean the elk aren't using it. If it's on the ground, that does not mean that. But what it means for you is you got to plan your strategy on how you're going to hunt it because they can become very difficult. And I'm going to be honest with you, they can become dangerous. So burns are not only hard to navigate, but they can be downright dangerous because guys do not pitch your tents in burns. I mean, come on. If the timber is standing, do not put your tent in there. You know, get on the edge, get away from, get, you know, get away from all the widow makers. It's super dangerous. And the daggers they create, the, the, you know, I have a friend of mine that ran a, a, a tree stop through his calf, completely through his calf. And because these trees, when they die, you know, pine trees, they create these nasty, sharp spikes. You know, as you know, you were cutting off a bunch of them for my llamas. Yeah. When we were on that bear hunt, we just, you were up the front with that saw, just sawing off everything <laughs> you could because, they're dangerous to us and they were dangerous to the llamas. Yeah. And um, so don't lose track. I know that's, you know, seems obvious. I just want to sometimes, sometimes I feel like the obvious gets forgotten. Yeah. So the shadows are an important tip um, when you're looking at, and then look back historical guys, you know, we're going to talk about this later. We talk about beetle kills, but beetle kill evaluation is critical and fire. Some of the same techniques that we use in beetle kills can be used in fires as well is looking back and aging that fire. Okay. So you can also go to a site called InsaWeb. I, I may I may have pronounced that Rob wrong, but um, it's I N C I or it's where they log all the information about all Western fires. Okay, and you can see when the fire started. It tell you it, they tell you lots of information about the fire. You know how long did it burn? Um, when did they get it out? Um, just all these things because, for example, let's just use an example. We had a fire here in Montana. I'm going to probably draw everybody over to it. By Red Lodge that started in June uh-huh. of this year. This fire went in June. It was pretty massive, pretty quick. Mm-hmm. It scared a lot of people. But the firefighters and the smoke jumpers, I mean, these guys were on it. And they got this dang thing pretty much out now already, wow. which is rare in the West for yeah. a fire to be put out in June. So think about here. We got this big fire now mm-hmm. in Red Lodge which is, I mean, good elk area. Okay, let's be honest. That started in June. That is already out. By next year, this fire could be money. Because it started early. There's already going to be some regrowth this this fall. Yeah. So by next season, this one-year-old fire could be money. I'm just speculating, guys, on this. I'd want to look at it a little closer myself. But what would I look at? Well, first thing I'd look at, what's the steepness of that train? That's the very first thing I'd look at. Hmm. If I'm looking at a one-year-old fire, first thing I want to know is how steep is the train? <clears throat> Excuse me. If it's super steep, I'm going to be like, okay, it's probably not going to regrow. The next thing I would look at is moisture content. So this year it's pretty dang dry in Montana, right? Mm-hmm. So 
I'm going to keep that in mind. Okay, so we've got a one-year fire. It started early, but but we are dry. Mm, maybe. Mm. I don't know. You just see see what we're doing here. We're kind of thinking about it from a logical standpoint. But if I saw a fire that started in August and they didn't get it out, they never got it out, and the snow put it out in in October, like what happens a lot, or the rain when the rains come, then I might not be super excited about that fire the next year. Mm-hmm even if the slope is good, okay? Mm-hmm. So keep in mind when this started, what month it started is important as not only all these other factors that we talked about. So so you cover that in more detail. You show people the shadows. <clears throat> I, we go over example. In I your, have eight or the- nine examples of burns of the mosaic patterns. I show you what it looks like, what it doesn't look uh-huh. like. Even some examples of straight edge burns. Yeah. So you know a lot of times a, a, a fire will burn up to a ridge and it'll burn itself out, mm-hmm. and it will leave a straight line. Guys, that doesn't mean that that's bad. So how does a guy tell the difference between beetle kill and a burn? Okay. So here's here's one of the things. Uh, and I'm not dissing on – I'm glad you said that because I was going to bring this up. <laughs> I always feel like i got to preface this because I get so much – oh, man, you could just hate on X. I do not <laughs> – hate on X. I do not hate guy. I love all the tools, guys. I'm just a tool guy. Okay. Mm-hmm. I don't get emotionally attached to my hunt platforms <laughs> and uh, you shouldn't either. Yeah. So that's tip number two. Yeah. <laughs> so if you only use hunt platforms, so what, let me back up. What I've seen, Brian, in e-scouting, what has happened is guys used to live on Google earth, right? Yeah. They lived on it. We did. Yeah. Okay. And then when the, Onyx came out and guy, they, they just organized all these tools and they just abandoned Google Earth. They went, they're doing all their stuff on, on, on the, on the Eat, hunt platforms. Onyx, yeah. Great. But they forgot why they were using Google Earth. So Google Earth is hands down, no question, the best e scouting tool on planet Earth. And it probably will be for some time because no matter what these platforms do, they cannot re- recreate the situation that's in Google Earth. Sure. And here's one of the examples fires. Okay. Onyx goes back to about 2002, okay? I think Gaia goes back to about 1999, whatever the um, – and I saw that Gohan only goes back to like 2006. Maybe. It doesn't matter. Don't get caught up in that detail. What I'm pointing out here is that they only go back so far. So when you start to look at an area and you see something that looks like a burn and you're not sure and you're like, is that a beetle kill? Potentially that's – or it's had an old burn that they don't have, have marked. How do you know? Go to Google Earth and you download the fire layer with the way I tell you how to get the fire layer. Mm. So you go to um, this resource. This is the same resource that Onyx uses, guys. The same resources that Gaia uses. You can go down, you can go to this site and you can download this layer called MTBS. And it's all of the fires in the United in the in North America since 1988. I always double check every single hunt area that I ever develop. I will look at in Google Earth and I will turn on that fire layer to make sure I didn't miss a really old fire. Not that I care that much. I mean, I wanted, I just want to know because I want to know how bad it could be, how much regrowth it could be. Is all the timber on the ground now? Yeah. And um, so that's the part that is a real issue. You know, Just trying to hunt an area where, where there's logs at your waist. Guys, I can't stress to you. So, you know, we talked about this in the previous module, a glassing spot and planning your route to the glassing spot, mm-hmm. right? Fires are almost more important that you plan your hunt route, mm-hmm. that you, how are you going to walk and navigate this, this fire? Your strat, where, the prevailing winds, thinking about where the winds are going to be coming from, how you're going to move around, where you're going to camp. Where you, how you're going to navigate this burn because you don't want to show up to a burn with no plan. Yeah. So let's go back to the beetle stuff. You know, you have all this mask die off from beetles. You know, the trees start to fall down. You, you have some similar, uh, you have similar, similar characteristics s- as a fire. Right. What do you prefer? A fire? I'm a beetle kill guy. Okay. For lots of reasons. And we'll talk, don't get ahead. We got a beetle okay. kill okay. module. <laughs> You always, you're like, oh, yeah, let's get off on that. Okay, subject. so we'll cover that. We're going to cover another... beetle kills. Now, I love fires and beetle kills. I don't get me wrong, but if I had to pick, I'd pick the beetle kill. Okay. And I'm going to tell you why I'd pick the beetle kill um, for my own personal reasons uh, when we get to that module. But fires, 
Um, very similar way evaluation tactics. Okay. Zooming in on Google Earth, using the historical timeline slider, really important uh, when you're a- analyzing fires. Using the fire layer in Google Earth so you can see all the old fires that are not available in the hunt platform. Guys, this podcast, that tip right there was probably worth the whole podcast. Just letting you know that a layer exists, a KML file exists for Google Earth that you can download and install into your Google Earth that will show you every fire in North America since 1988. One of the other things it shows is when you click on the fire, it's got about 25 characteristics to that fire. So way a lot more information is available than what's available on the hunt platform. So for example, in I'm, I'm, I've been picking on Onyx. So let's just say Gaia. So we're in Gaia and we click on the fire in Gaia for more information, right? Yeah. Tells us how many acres, tells us um, what date the fire is, right? Yep. That's about it. But when you go to Google Earth, what do you get? You get the month that started. That's key. You get the year, obviously. You get all of the fires, clear back to 1988. You get, um, um, you get, sometimes you get links to the fire data, like the InsaWeb stuff. You get when they got it put out. You get lots of things in Google Earth that you will not get in the hunt platforms when it comes to learning about this particular fire. Okay. So, um, for example, you know, um, I will look at a fire in Onyx. I'll be like, okay, I see the VAR. It's a, it's a recent fire. I will almost always jump over to Google Earth just real quick, and I'll click on the fire and see if there's any more information available mm-hmm. that's not available here. Guys, if there's one thing you're going to learn um, from me, that if there's anything you're going to learn, is historical knowledge kills elk, okay? What I mean by that is the more knowledge you put in your head about your hunt area – the more, the better your odds of killing an elk. Mm. Is it is it the silver bullet? No. Knowing this fire information, knowing when it started, when it was put out, when is is that the silver bullet to killing elk? No. But when you stack that with the next piece of information, with the mm. next piece of information, with the mosaic patterns, with the entrance and exits, with the um all the things we talked about, the island meccas, the island um island yeah. patches, these things all start to come together. And when you look at a fire you start looking at it in a different mindset than you know. Most hunters look, oh, there's a fire. I'm going to go there and hunt elk. They don't know why. They just heard yeah. somebody say mm-hmm. in a one-minute e-scouting video that fires are good for elk. And so I'm going to go right. to this fire. Right, right. So um, when I lived in Oregon, we were often targeting clear cuts for blacktail and for elk. And that was kind of a big deal, major deal, actually, because – uh, the more clear cuts, the more that the actual elk habitat exists, especially right. when you're hunting West coast. Right. But, um, but I got to admit, since I've been hunting, you know, more of the Idaho, Montana, Colorado, you know, um, type of, of areas, Wyoming, I'm not really dealing with as many clear cuts as I have in other areas. Well, you're not, you're best. not looking for them as much. Okay. Cause you're not focused on them because they're not And and let's just face it in Washington, Oregon, that is the elk finding feature. Yeah. It's true. one of the top features, right? right? Right. Well, in Montana, we've got other features. We got these fires. Yeah. We've got these be- massive beetle kills that they don't have there. Yeah. We've got different landscape. We've got glassing opportunities that are not available in Oregon. For sure. And watch, right? We can see the elk before we kill the elk um, in some areas. Yep. And yep. there's just all these other things that you've replaced. So what you just said is what we talked about before is that you don't know why you're doing it. You're just an experienced enough hunter. You've started looking at all these other features and they're attracting you. And maybe you hit on something. Maybe in Montana, oh, maybe we shouldn't say this. <laughs> maybe in Montana that the log areas are being overlooked. Maybe if you spend some time looking at timber patches, um, well, how, let's just stop yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. How do you know where the timber patches are? How do you know um, how old the, the timber harvest is how do you know what they do did they a lot cl- of people don't find out until they show up in their hunting area right. and they stumble on it did they clear cut it did they yeah. just fire suppress it did they thin it did they okay. was it fire prevention what was the mechanism what kind of operation was it did they build roads in there did they not build roads in there hmm. how long did it go on yeah well how if you go if you cut? go to on x and you look at timber it's going to tell you 
you know, they've got a timber layer. You can turn it on. Mm-hmm. It'll show you the clear cuts. It'll give you a couple details about the timber. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Guys, in Google, I know I, I'm a broken record when it comes to Google Earth, but this same website that has the fire layer mm-hmm. has the logging operations layer for the whole entire North America. Guys, and then, now there's some, you can't just download it and install it into Google Earth. I'm, I don't want to get into the technical weeds here, but it's too big. It's over one gig. Okay. It's a giant file. So what you have to do is it's called restrict to view. That's all I'm going to get into. So you have to install it with a restrict to view. And once you do that, then you can use it. But when you click on the fire in Google Earth, you would not believe the list of information that comes up that's available. Mm-hmm. The Forest Service provides all this information. It tells you when who's who the operation is doing the thinning. You can call. It's got numbers sometimes. It's got... When it started, is it still going on? Is it active? Is it closed? The road network integration. Uh, did they replant the roads? Did they reseed the roads? Um, all this information is there that's not in the hunt platforms. Mm-hmm. So if you are focused on timber and logging areas, if you're in Oregon and Washington, my gosh, you need to be using this tool on <laughs> Google Earth. Yeah. It's a mecca. It's a mecca of information about these fire, I'm not fires, about these logging areas. So in the in this module, I go over quite a bit of the logging stuff, but I am I've got a lot of emails. To believe it or not, Brian, one my top two states of members in my course is Washington, Oregon. <laughs> so I'm getting a lot of heat to do more on logging. So yeah. I will have more coming on the in the logging stuff. Very cool. Well, dude, I think this gives people a taste. There's a lot of good information in this, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, we talked a little fast and a little... You're trying to get through it, but... But um, I, I think it gave some guys some, you yeah. know, uh, at least some tidbits to to look at. And, um, you know, when it comes to fires, guys, last thing I'm going to say about it is, it's for me, it's another odds multiplier, okay? It's not the odds multiplier. Yeah. So if you... I think as an elk hunter, you have to work really hard not to become one dimensional. It's like, man, I only hunt bulls. I only hunt elk in fires. I only hunt elk in logging areas. I only hunt elk in north facing drainages. I only hunt <laughs> right, canyons right. with no trails in the bottom. Yeah. You know, no, we're looking for is all these things wrapped up. When I find these things that have all these features, like when I find fire zones that have the canyons like we talked about yeah. and has the meadows like we talked about even prior, yeah, I start getting excited about that thing. When mm-hmm. I see meadows with halos around them in a fire close to the edge, I'm like, okay, you know. Yeah. So that's, it, like, that's like people who say, I only hunt elk if I can call. I only call elk. Right, right. Like, well, why not a little spot and stock? Why not a little ambush from a tree stand? Well, why not? I don't care. No, nah, tree stands. Well, come on. No. <laughs> I don't you're, care. You're crossing the line I don't now. care. If I can kill a big bull in a public land hunt, I'll use whatever uh, tool is in my uh, my toolbox. Well, you know, it's funny you said that, Ryan, because even myself, okay, I spent most of my years coming from Missouri. So I hunted Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, <clears throat> and that was back when you could actually draw a tag in New Mexico. Yeah. Um, I had a hard time driving through states that had elk to get to other states that had elk. Yeah. So I just stop in those states and hunt elk. Well, I didn't do I hunted in thicker areas. Mm-hmm. So I was more of a caller, like you said. I didn't really branch out into a spot and stock or more of a glassing style elk hunter until I got to Montana and started looking at some of the areas that I'm like, whoa, these areas are way more open. Yeah. This is a whole different type of elk hunting. And My I, kind of elk hunting right Idaho, there. Idaho has a lot of that type of yep. um, as well. Now, Idaho has some thick stuff too yep. in, in the northern parts. But like you said, not trying to, I'm trying to become less one dimensional, even myself. Even 30 years into this, there's, we can always learn. Um, guys, I'm telling you, when I put together this fire module, for example, I did not know half of what I found out when I started researching this thing. Yeah. I thought I knew everything about fires because I hunt elk in fire areas a lot. Yeah. But when I started reading all these research papers and all the reasons why elk, I did not understand the edge. I didn't under, I knew I was finding an elk on the edge. I didn't know why. Now mm. I know why. Mm. Just the research really gave me a lot of um of the whys and really started to clear up the picture of why elk use burns, when they use them, how long they use them, and why they prefer them. Now, one thing I will say real quick, I know we're going to move on, but guys, the wolves are changing the games a little bit in burns and logged areas. Um 
it's pushing elk out of them more and more. Yeah. Because the, well, on the, on the bear hunt we were on, when we saw that black wolf, mm-hmm. where was he at? On the logging road. Yep. Cruising a what? A logged area. Well, a burn logged area. Cut area, yeah. So these elk are, can be, depends on the terrain and the areas, obviously, but they can be more susceptible to wolf predation yeah. when they're in these areas. Yeah, you have to start accounting for the wolf factor. You have to nowadays. Areas it's a, a, it's a Western different. factor that you cannot ignore. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't quite tell some of that um it's such a new a new stu- a phenomena for a lot of us that have been hunting elk our whole lives right because they're just reaching certain critical population levels in area certain areas where the elk have completely we're learning as we go yeah. as hunters okay this is how the elk handle wolves so when you're looking at burns, I'm not saying don't hunt them because there could be wolves in there. That's definitely not it because they're definitely not true. But just keep in mind that, you know, if you're in an area and you're seeing a lot of wolf sign, you're seeing a lot of wolf scat, and you're hunting a burn, you might not want to invest entire five days in that burn if you're not seeing elk because there might be a reason you're not seeing yep. them. But the reason you're not seeing them is not because there's not vegetation there. It's because the wolves have got them pushed out of there at, right. the, at this time. They're too easy to kill in in that particular spot they're they're vulnerable in those areas especially you know when they have offspring that is a certain age still or but what i found uh in areas with burns on steeper slopes in wolf country they spend time in those burns when it's flat in wolf country that's right they're not down there in those burns anymore they were 20 years ago 15 years ago they're not there anymore that's right right. and i'm finding elk imp and burns up high and they're thriving up, and that's where they spend their time because the escape routes are a little easier from wolves up in there. You know, the one thing about wolves is they can out, <coughs> they can run down an elk, get them tired, split one off, you know, uh, rip its hamstring and bring it down. I don't think people realize how easy it is for an, a, wolf, a wolf to kill an elk. Yeah. When you uh, look at the bite force of a wolf, I put it in the recent yeah, videos. I, that blew my. I did not know that. Fifteen hundred pounds of pressure per. I could per not inch. believe that when you compared it to the average dog. Didn't you compare the, it? The, the strongest dog is the is the is the Kangal, and it's a Turkish type of wolf dog, and it's it's seven hundred. So not even half. Not even. Not even not half. half. And the next strongest they say is maybe a Doberman at six hundred. You know, a couple other dogs. Most of them. Most dogs around four or five. Yeah. So you're talking about 1500 psi on a on a plus when you look at the teeth on a wolf versus the teeth on your dog at home you realize like that's like comparing a human's <laughs> teeth to like a like a mythical werewolf yeah. like there's those wolf teeth are another whole another level of of nasty like they make they make domestic dogs look <laughs> like 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 not the same, like they, they just, they like just totally a, different, gen- totally different genome. So when you, t- when you look at that, uh, you realize, you know, it doesn't take much for a wolf to just grab onto and rip a tendon in half. And when a hamstring goes, that elk can't go anymore. Yeah. It's done. And then their pack can pull it down and it, it's a relatively, uh, it's, it doesn't have much of a chance. How do wolves, when I was in BC up North in the Cassiar mountain range, there was like a pack of 30 over here and a pack of 30 wolves over here. We just watched them. There's 60 wolves within 200 yards of each other. And they kind of intermingled and howled in the two packs. Maybe it was two packs. Maybe it was one massive pack. I don't know. The, anything they choose to go after with that many numbers, though, yeah. is dead. Yeah. The, anything they choose. But the, what did the moose do? I'm like, how did the moose survive this? Well, the moose go into those willow patches that are neck deep and so thick that they can just walk into the midst of them. And the wolves just can't chase them in there Yeah, and they can run around in there all day. The, 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 the moose and the wolves just can't get to them. And they can defend themselves better in that close yeah. quarter kind yeah. of operation. I mean, you the wolves have to them. like squirm in and there. They, they can't surround them as easily. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's the same thing. And, and the so the wolves part- know that the, the, they know that the, the moose run to these patches. So they're trying to catch them in these areas before they can get into these escape play. areas, right? They look both ways for they run. Totally. <laughs> and what you start to put together is you start to see these, these same with the elk we were running into this 
the spring during bear season, they were in the steepest oh, stuff. Man. I couldn't believe where we that were that. neck deep, um, where these these elk were just getting on these slopes, like in that canyon where we crossed the river and go yeah. up the other side. You'd see twenty elk just where you'd see like a bighorn sheep, <laughs> yeah. and they're on the slope that's ridiculous, but it's neck deep, and no wolf is going to get in there and get them. Period. So they're spending a lot of time browsing and hanging out there all day long. Would they be there if there wasn't wolf pressure? No, that's a lot. They that's not their preferred location. Well, they have to work harder for food in that environment. Yeah, let's just be honest. They're not walking out into open meadow grazing. Be so nice to be able to do that. But every time they walk on that meadow, and start grazing. They got their hamstrings being chewed on. Yeah, and it doesn't take long. Elk are smarter than we give them credit for. Right, and they start to figure out. Well, I can feed in that meadow so long as I have this hill to run to. Yeah. You know, and I can get there or I can cross this river and leave the wolf behind or whatever it is. And yeah. you start to see a little change. Um, but you add that to your e-scouting arsenal and you can it, start it, to really get lethal. Factor. Like Brian just said, putting that historical knowledge in this wolf behavioral analysis is just one of those historical knowledge. You start looking at areas, you go, okay, I'm going to do some research. I'm going to see... What kind of, you know, guys, they really study the wolves. I mean, mm-hmm. the states that have wolves, they've got a good idea where they're at. Yeah. They got pack names. They've got pack ranges. Guys, it's all available on the website. These wolves know where these kill boxes are. Oh, yeah. They have these these areas where, where if an elk walks through this kill box, they, boom, they kill it. Like, it can't get away. Like, it's the perfect trap. The wolves know it. The elk figure it out over time. And the only ones that ever go through there are the ones that didn't get the memo, you know, and they, they, you'll see areas where guys were like, dude, I used to hunt elk in that Canyon and they were always bedded up right there. I haven't seen elk in there in, in 10 years. Well, because it's no longer conducive to elk given wolves being there. And that's just a, that's just something that people are, are adapting to as we move forward. Well, as a hunter, we have to for just to highlight that point anymore. So I guide llama trips in Yellowstone. I think you know that. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the trips I take every year that I really like is the Black Canyon of the Yellowstone, which is where the Yellowstone River, um, you know, uh, comes out of Yellowstone. And um, it's the dark, they call it the Black Canyon or, you know, Hell's Canyon or whatever. Mm-hmm. Brian, you would not believe the deadheads in there. Really? The elk. Now, you obviously can't bring out sheds in Yellowstone, mm-hmm. so people leave them. But I've been all over Yellowstone on these. I've never seen anything like this. Really? But it's yeah. exactly what you talk about. It's a canyon. It's a mm-hmm. box canyon. And it's the migration corridor for elk that still live in Yellowstone, which they is have half to. Many. They have to use it. And they have to come out. And the and they're all – every sh- deadhead we find – is the giant ones. Yeah. They're giant because it's those last bulls that are waiting. They don't want to leave the park because they know that there's an arsenal of gun hunters and gardener waiting for them yep, to come yep, out. Yep. But I'm just predict. I'm just, I'm guessing here. I yep. don't know for sure what the reasons are, but we're hiking up the trail. It's just like, there's a giant six by seven dead here. There's a, I mean, it's just littered with dead heads mm-hmm. in this one Canyon. And it's because it's the way out and yeah. the wolves, I bet in the winter time, they're just laying in there. Just, waiting yeah and when the when they start coming through they just start killing and and in and in those situations uh it's much like calving season you know we were just up north hunting grizzly bear and the moose all drop calves at the same time mother nature knows th- what they There's a term for that i can't ever remember they're all dropping in yeah. in the same two or three week window because they just flood the place with so much food that even though the wolves kill 50% of the, the cow, moose, calves, or 60% in the grizzly bear, they can't kill them all because there's just so many. Right. And then what you end up with is, uh, you know, 30% that survive and, and make it through uh, to an older age or whatever that number is. And you're it's the same thing when they're migrating. They just are like, okay, everybody, 300 of us are going to shoot the gauntlet. <laughs> 40 of us are going to be sacrificed. Yeah. That's just the way it but goes. But if we go one but at a time. But if we go one at a time, <laughs> they'll just kill us all. Yeah. You know, so um, I think uh, you're swarming the predator population with with sacrificial food 
of the of the herd to try to um get the rest through and so See, every- Brian, i always thought about like that when we were on our bear hunt you know you're in the back right <laughs> yeah the back. i always thought right. kind of like that like <laughs> sacrificial in country and brian's back there he's our <laughs> sacrificial lamb um he's back in the back at his pace and uh um, yeah, yeah. i thought if i just stay in the middle they're gonna either <laughs> eat ryan up front or they'll eat Brian in the back, and I'll, I'll be in good shape here and right here in the middle. Yeah, I, it, there's no question that uh, I was in the dangerous, the dangerous <laughs> position. All right. Actually, Ryan could bump into him, so that, that's right. That that's why I liked where I was at, right yeah. in the middle. Uh, being, I'm more worried. I'm less worried about something creeping up behind us and stalking us from behind. Yeah, right. You're right. Than I am uh, walking around a corner and running into a sow with cubs and. And just her do, doing her thing, you know. That's right. I'd rather take the chance. So that's it, hey, that folks. A good one. Yeah. yeah, good. Uh, we're the next one is going to be. Um, oh shoot! What is it, Mark? All right, hold on. Let me look real quick. It is oh beetle kills. Here we go. And sparse timber. All right. Tune in next time for uh, the beetle kill uh, module. We're going to talk about that. And if you guys just want to go right in, check out Tree Line Academy. Uh, you've got your course there. How much is the course, Mark? The course is one nineteen. Uh, with your discount, they get it for ninety nine. And so, there you go. Yeah, use the code Gritty. Save yourself some money, and uh, I love, um, you know, I love partnering with it. And um, to, you know, I appreciate a, it too. And um, it's a win win, folks. It's a win win. I don't think anyone that's ever purchased it that I've talked to. I was doing the Elk Summit up on the hill here uh, over the summer. Every course I did, I prefaced it with, look, I'm going to talk to you guys for like an hour and a half, but I'm telling you, everyone in this class should just go get this e-scouting course because what you cover in that lengthy period of time is gold. And uh, there was always two to three people in the class that had already purchased it. And I barely got through my like little spiel and all of those people were like, He's right. You all need to do this. Trust me. It's it's been a game changer. Thank so, you. Um, it's really cool. So, folks, check that out. And then you you are going to come out with some more modules like yeah, bear. I'm adding. I'm adding. Well, I'm going to add to the course too. Or, uh, so, mule deer rather and stuff. Um, oh, I'm. You know, we haven't said this yet, but your membership in the course, guys. There's a lot here. Mm-hmm. I mean, in some regards, maybe too much, but it's 30 modules currently, and it's about 26 hours of video. So it's pretty intense. This is not something you're going to do on the drive out to yeah, hunt. Yeah. <laughs> this is something that needs to be invested in a little before your hunt. So um, actually, right now would not be a bad time. To get you're started. You're getting a little tight right now, but you still could pull it off. But remember, when I started doing this course, I knew it was going to be a lot. And so that's why I did the two-year membership. So business-wise, that probably wasn't the smartest decision. I've had a lot of people say, dude, that's stupid. I'm like... <laughs> You, I don't feel like you can absorb what I've put in here, especially unless you're, you know, you've got a lot of experience and free just, time. Yeah. If you're a newer hunter, I feel like you need two years to hone your game in this area. Yeah. So anyway, it's a two year membership. So two full elk seasons. That's pretty cool. So check it so out. Check that out, folks. Use the code gritty over there. Thanks for tuning in. Look for the next one. It's on beetle kills and, uh, stay gritty. <laughs>